if you purchase a machine, for example, and based on your analysis, based on your knowledge, yeah, this machine can produce one million unit, for example, okay, until it's down, you know, until it cannot be used anymore, right? So that one million unit is the total unit of production. If we take the example of vehicle, for example, vehicle normally we measure by what? The, the mileage, yeah, the mileage. For example, that we have this vehicle, and f during its um, during its useful period, for example, okay, until it totally condemned, you know, you cannot use it anymore. So maybe that it can go on the road up to 500,000 yeah or 1 million you know 1 million miles 1 million kilometer for example so that total you may use that as a total unit of production or you know total unit of usage for example for vehicle yeah but the same principles, yeah? So that means, over here, so once you got this, yeah? So we, if, if we want to apply that method into this example, so that machine expected to produce a maximum of 100,000 unit, yeah? And the, with the salvage value of 5,000. So in this example, you need to know the exact amount of production or being produced in one particular year in order for you to determine the depreciation amount. Yeah? So in this example, we have to determine the depreciation per unit. So in this example, yeah, you take the cost, right? Take the cost of fifty thousand, you minus the salvage value divided by the total of unit produced, okay, for the entire uh, duration, and you got that point four five per unit, and you use that. So in that year, for example, the machine produced twenty two thousand unit, for example. So the depreciation expense is. 9,900 yeah it's a bit different than the straight line method just now okay so the depreciation expense okay depreciation expense is basically varies yeah varies according to the usage so 2010 there 2010 there no depreciation expense if we follow this method, so you have, I mean, you don't have to expand, so you don't have to expand depreciation amount for the, for, for, I mean, during the period which the machine is not being used. Just sit either there. Yeah. Okay. And the other method is declining method. Um, this is the, the concept behind this method is basically the depreciation expense is, is, is basically high okay, in the early years and low in the later years. Yeah? Basically the justification is that you know, um, they try to be balanced okay? um, because during the early years, maybe the machine might not uh, need a huge expenditure uh, for repairs, yeah, as compared to the later years. So um, it can. Uh, I mean, uh, at the end of the day, we're going to have a quite an equal distribution of expenditure there. Yeah? Okay. How this how this method is used? Um, this is this one of the method here. Okay, 
double declining is basically we start with getting the rate you know, from the straight line method. Okay? We are given the useful life. Okay? We are given the useful life. So the useful life is basically five years. So one year is 20%. Yeah? One year is 20%. So 100%, yeah? Uh, 100% divided by 5 years, so we get a rate of 20%. So from this 20%, you just multiply it by 2, yeah? And you get 40%. And you use that rate, actually. You use that rate and multiply by the book value, yeah? By the, by the book value and to get the depreciation expense. So for the first year, for the first year, okay, to fulfill this one, yeah? In the early years, the depreciation is high compared to the later years. So over here, you will see that in the early years, okay, the amount is high. So in the first year, in the first year, the rate, yeah, the rate will be uh, 40%, uh, uh, yeah, 40%, and the amount is 20,000, yeah, how you get that? 40% divided by the, multiplied by, uh, by the book value, and then we got 20,000. How about in the second year? Okay, the second year, right, the, still using the same rate but the figure that you use now is different okay um, for income tax purpose you have to prepare a different statement because what In, for income tax purpose it requires a different way of calculating the depreciation so if your company is calculating the depreciation based on this one, you may use this for a public purpose, but not for the income tax purpose. So for income tax purpose, it close to this one. It close to this one. Yeah. So that's why, I mean, uh, some company, if they were given a choice, they would go toward this method because it will um, the the net income will differ not that much okay when they want to submit for for income tax purpose yeah again um, different company may have a different fiscal period or accounting period. And also, um, a company may also purchase asset on a different date. Yeah? Life is so nice, you know. If you have your account start from 1st January, close 31st December, and you purchase your asset on the 1st of January. Okay? But life is not that way. Okay? In most circumstances, you have to. Yeah? Company purchase asset in the middle of the accounting period. Yeah? In the middle of the accounting period. So in that sense, you have to, you have to take that into consideration and you have to Calculate the depreciation amount based on the fraction of year. Yeah, based on the fraction of year. You have to go by months. Yeah? You have to go by months. So for example, yeah, for example here. Okay. For, for example, that if your accounting period will be from 1st January until 31st of December. 
And if you purchase the asset on 2nd of July, for example, so when you determine the depreciation amount for that particular year, you only have to account or expand only half of the amount for, okay, only half of the amount for one year, of a year, okay. So if one year is uh, 1,000, for example, so in that particular year, you only have to account for 500 only. So this is what we mean by partial year depreciation. So that means you have to really observe when the asset is basically purchased. Yeah? We also have the situation where where we change the estimate of the depreciation. What is basically the estimate? The estimate can be in various form. It can be the useful period. Okay? At the initial stage, you predict that the useful life is only five years. But after you use the asset, after two or three years, you realize that the useful life is longer than that. Maybe 10 years, for example. Right? Or you also you may have the situation like, you know, um, um, maybe the salvage value is different and so on. Yeah? So if that happens, you have to recalculate. Yeah? You have to recalculate the depreciation. So we take the example here. Yeah. Um, originally, the useful life of this asset is 10 years with no salvage value. But after three years being used, the company realized that the useful life is, is only it's only eight years, yeah? not 10 years. So that means there are only five years left. Yeah? Five years left, yeah? not seven years, not seven years. Yeah? So in this manner, this is basically, you may use this formula yeah? to get the right amount, to get the new amount of depreciation so you get the book value at the date of change. Yeah? You, have, you have to find the book value on the date of change. And then also the salvage value. Okay? And, and divided by that by the useful life at the date of change to get the, to get the new revised annual depreciation yeah? for that particular asset. Yeah? So this is new amount. Yeah? This is new amount divided by the by this particular yeah? remaining remaining years. Yeah? Remaining new years. Yeah? New life. Yeah? New life. So from this year, the depreciation amount will be four thousand uh, two hundred. Yeah? Okay. But again, yeah. Again, uh, even though it's it's easy on paper, yeah? but in real life, you have to show this, the effect retrospectively, okay? For until the last, last five years, okay? on, the changes, on the changes of this. Yeah? Yeah? So have to, you have to show, for example, the last, yeah, in this example, the last three years. In the last three years, for example, you have to show the effect of net income with the new with with the new depreciation um, method okay method that you use yeah okay okay this is how we report yeah or we disclose in the um, in the annual report yeah we disclose um, the these are the these are the costs of the asset. Yeah, these are the costs. 
and these are the total depreciation okay for that asset and below is the these are the book value huh? these are the book value of all asset yeah? uh, while you are using this asset um, you may face or you may be in a situation where some expenditure incurred which related to the asset and you in that situation you have to decide on how to the best way to record that particular transaction um, to help you yeah, to help you in your recording yeah, um, you may ask yeah, you may ask for example the nature of the expenditure if the expenditure incurred on that particular asset and it increase the value of the asset yeah the value of the asset so in that example um, you have to you cannot record or you cannot treat that expenditure um, as um, as an as an expense yeah? as a revenue expenditure where you going to record that in the income statement but you have to record that in the in the balance sheet right so let me show you yeah if the expenditure incur increase the value of the asset for example that building yeah building he has a balance here yeah balance of 10000 10000 if there are there is some expenditure that incur and it make it add value okay to this building and it, it, it also help to make the val the value of the building higher okay in that example you have to record that in the building account Let's say that is involved one thousand of you know, and you use cash for that. This example of where maybe you can maybe you make an extension to the current building, yeah. For any extension, for example, definitely that will increase the value of the of the asset. Yeah, so. That one thousand expenditure is what we call the capital expenditure. So capital expenditure, you have to record that in the asset account. Okay, the asset will increase. But if it's only a normal maintenance, there's a leakage, for example, in your house. Okay, and then you have to incur a certain expenditure. Will that expenditure will add value to the building? Not, I mean, um, yeah, not, um, not directly. Okay, not directly. Um, so in that, for that example, you will not record that. Maybe it will cost one hundred, for example. You don't record in the building, but just a normal expenditure. Okay. For example, for for repairs, and then you record cash of one hundred, and this will go to the comprehensive income statement, and this will be shown in the statement of financial position. Yeah, so. This one thousand will not appear in the in the comprehensive income statement. Yeah. Okay. 
again, that's why I, um, as an accountant, you must be able to tell whether that transaction okay, will increase the value of the building. Yeah? To be certain, of course, you, know, you have to hire a valuer and this valuer will come at, and advise you. For example, that with that uh, addition, it will increase the, the value of the building. So if you, know, if, if you have that evidence, so you may put that in the uh, as the capital expenditure. Yes, yes, good. It's, it's good to have because sometimes the, the auditor will ask. Because remember the issue of earning management? Sometimes people, they, if they're given a choice, they're going to play around with that. Okay? For example, that this one, yeah? Maybe it's not an extension. Extension is quite a clear cut, just an additional technology. You know, added, for example, to that house. For example, you put um, a alarm system, for example. Alarm system, yeah? Alarm system almost costs almost the same, 1,000, for example. So you are not pretty sure. Either you want to use record here or as a here. Because you know the implication, right? Remember the earning management issue? Okay. Let's say that, that year you want to see the profit higher. So if you want to see the profit higher, for example, definitely putting it here is better, right? Okay, because if you put that as an expenditure, a revenue expenditure, it will eat your, your income. So it will not, you know, it will reduce the net income. Yeah. So... If you feel that you don't want to have a high net income on that particular year for various reasons, so maybe you can also put this one instead of this one. So if you can't make, because at the end of the day, you are answerable to auditor and also the public. So it's good if you cannot, uh, as certain as yourself, it's good if you can get a second opinion from the, from the expert. Yeah, from the expert. Because again, especially if you are a listed company, you are basically bound to any litigation. Because, um, for example, as uh, SC, Security Commission, who is overseeing the operation of all the public listed company, they are very particular, very concerned on this, on this issue of earning management. So this is more de more detailed explanation for that. You know, for example, if it's only an ordinary repairs, just a maintain normal operating condition, and does not increase productivity. For example, does not extend life beyond original estimate. For example, maybe that one you can consider as a revenue expenditure, and you put that in a comprehensive income statement. Okay, I think maybe this is one of the tests that you may use. Okay, but if it's for betterment, betterment, increase the value of the company of that of the asset, over extraordinary repairs, for example, over extraordinary, for example, that your car break down, if you change the whole engine, for example, the entire engine you 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 change, so this is the capital expenditure or revenue expenditure, capital expenditure, yeah. So this is what we mean by that. Yeah? Because it extends life you know, beyond the original estimate. Yeah? Right? Okay. Last part from this um, non-current asset is um, how are you going to deal with disposal of asset? Um, there are circumstances that a company may have to discuss dispose their asset so if that happen company has to record properly because they have to recognize whether from the transaction the company will gain or loss okay 
gain or loss. The formula that you may use is that you may um, you may use this just to see the difference between cash and book value. That's why you have to really good at determining the book value. Remember how to determine the book value? Cost minus accumulated depreciation. So that you have to know that formula. Without knowing that formula, okay, you cannot determine whether is there a loss or gain out of disposal of asset. Yeah. Okay. So if the cash Cash is basically the proceed, yeah, the proceed. The cash that you get from the sales of the asset is bigger, okay? It's bigger than the book value. It's basically a gain. It's basically a gain. Uh, you may use a book value as a cost. The cash that you receive as another proceed so the amount that you get and the cost yeah and the cost if you see the difference so if the amount that you get more than the book value so you are making gain there All right so you are making gain and this is another way around if the cash or proceed that you get from the disposal of asset is less yeah less than the book value so you are making you are making loss yeah you are making loss um so maybe we can take the example here take the example from here can we determine, okay, uh, we go to the basic, yeah? What, for us to determine the, pro, the gain or loss, what are the variables that we need? Book value. Sorry? Book, book value and we have to di differentiate between the the gain and loss, basically the difference between book value and cash or proceed. Cash and proceed. So that means you need to have these two variables to determine gain or loss. Okay? Alright. Now we have to go reverse back. We need to get the we need to get we need to get the the book value right yeah remember to determine the gain or loss from disposal of asset the variable that we need to know is book value and also the cash Right? Remember the formula? If the cash that you receive more than book value, you are making gain or loss? Gain. And vice versa. Right? Okay. So now we can determine the cash, right? The cash we know that we will know because the amount that we receive at the end during the sales of the asset. Now the issue of book value. How to determine the book value? Cost minus accumulated depreciation. Yeah. Accumulated depreciation. This accumulated depreciation is what what constitute accumulated depre depreciation 
the accumulated depreciation from the day one you acquire or you purchase the asset until the date that you want to sell. That is the accumulated depreciation. Yeah? So in this example, for example, how long is the accumulated depreciation? You have to know when the machine was purchased. January 2004. January 2004. So, when it's disposed? 3rd September 2007. So, the accumulated depreciation is basically the total depreciation from here until here. So, you have to calculate. So, for example, 2004, 2004, how much the depreciation? 2005, how much the depreciation? 2006, how much the depreciation? 2007, how much depreciation? So remember how shall we determine the depreciation? The basic question that we, know, we need to know to determine depreciation is what? Different method will give different amount, right? Yes. So we have to determine the method used first. Good. So we are using a straight line method. So using a straight line method, remember the formula? Yes. Using the straight line method, cost minus salvage value divided by useful life. So can we, using this formula, can we determine the depreciation for 2004? How much? Sorry? Cost hundred thousand, useful life ten thousand, and then salvage. So eight, I mean, hundred thousand minus uh, minus twenty. You got eighty. Eighty minus eight uh, minus ten. So eight thousand. So two o four, eight thousand. Yeah. Two o five. Depreciation, 8,000. 206, 8,000. 207, yeah, how much? 6, 6,000. So how much the accumulated depreciation? 30? 30,000. So, shall we determine the book value now? So, all these are called what? The 30,000 is called what? Accumulated depreciation. So, all these are called accumulated depreciation. So, shall we determine the book value now? So, how, what is the formula of book value? The formula for book value, how we get the book value? Cost minus accumulated depreciation. So cost, how much? 100,000. Accumulated depreciation? Book value 70%? 70,000, correct? 70,000. So sh now, shall we determine gain or loss? How much we, we sell? 60,000. 60, so we get 60,000. So 60,000 versus 70,000. So? Yeah? So? 10,000 loss. Loss of? 
loss of 10,000. Okay? Um, which what we call intangible asset, yeah? Intangible asset is basically, um, of course, is intangible. You know, something that you cannot touch, you cannot see. So, these are the example of intangible asset that one company may have. Yeah. Um, one example is the right to extract. Yeah, the right to extract the natural resources. Um, okay, this example of um, if a company is in a gas and uh, oil and gas, for example, uh, they obtain the right. Yeah, they obtain the right to extract. Uh, either oil or other natural resources from from that area. Okay, the right to extract is basically one of the intangible asset. Yeah, one of the intangible asset. Um, how shall we expand? How shall we expand the cost? Um, which related um, to the um, expenditure that incur in the process of we are using the right, yeah. The method that we use um, for for ex, um, for recognizing the expense for natural res resources is is what we call the depletion yeah depletion and this is the formula that we normally use to determine the depletion expense we have to use this formula where it has a depletion per unit multiplied by number of unit removed so to get this one, yeah, just like the um, the depreciation based on based on production just now, okay. Once we get the depletion per unit, then we can determine the depletion expense. Yeah. So how to determine the depletion per unit is basically cost, yeah, cost that the company use. Okay, incur to purchase the right to explore the natural resources in that particular area. And minus by residual value, if there any, and then multiply by the estimated total unit of natural resources. Yeah, one over estimated total unit of natural resources. Yeah. Okay, so once you have this, so you can determine the depletion expand yeah okay another um, this is basically the description of intangible asset right so non current asset something that you cannot see and touch yeah without a physical substance um, normally give you the right yeah, give you the right uh, to to use yeah and in most circumstances this intangible asset are big, difficult to determine its useful life and normally used for the for the operation only yeah okay for intangible asset even though almost the same concept as depreciation, but we don't depreciate this intangible asset, but we amortize it. Yeah? Um, the way we amortize the intangible asset is best, normally we use the straight line method. Yeah? We, we just divide, we just take the cost and divide it by the 
by the useful life. Yeah? Okay, these are the example of intangible asset. Okay, something that you have to be clear, yeah. Most of these intangible asset are normally purchased from the other party. Yeah? Most of these intangible asset, for example, pattern, for example, the pattern that you purchase from the other company. Yeah. Um, even though you can develop your own pattern, okay. For example, Apple has thousands of patterns that they develop by themselves. Even though companies develop patterns, but it's a bit difficult for a company to recognize pattern as an asset in their financial statement. Okay, uh, so now we have to differentiate between two categories. Yeah? One is pattern that purchase from outside parties. So in that manner, just straight away, for example, you debit patterns and credit cash. So, for example, that if you purchase 10,000 for a pattern, for example, so you have 10,000 um, worth of pattern, okay, in your financial statement, in the, compre in the uh, statement of financial position of 10,000. If you record 10,000, no question asked. So, that means you, I mean, you, you don't have to defense okay on how you obtain the 10000 okay again yeah if you op if you purchase a pattern you account you cost the pattern based on the amount that you paid for okay but if the pattern is something you develop yourself that's a bit challenging that's a bit challenging because it's very difficult for a company to quantify the cost incurred in the process of developing a patent. So that's why in most cases, company will not recognize the pattern, the cost of pattern, which they develop by themselves. Okay? Again, until and unless they have evidence to show that these are the expenditure incurred in the process of they developing their own pattern. The clear expenditure would be what? Pattern registration. You have to pay. You have to register and pay for the pattern to the government. Yeah? So these are normally costs that you may incur, that you may record as a to to determine the cost of the pattern that you develop by yourself yeah? so if you want to include another expendi and I, I mean other expenditure is 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 very difficult because you don't have any evidence to support yeah? okay so most of this example is basically just assuming that if you are you are purchase you know if you purchase the pattern yeah so if you purchase the patterns how shall you determine the amount of amortization just take the cost and then divide it by the by the useful life yeah even though uh, normally using the universal standard pattern should not have a useful life longer than 20 years yeah okay so this is how you record them Amortization expense and then you credit accumulated amortization. Yeah. Okay, how about copyright? Same principle apply. Normally you all the copyright asset that you have on your financial statements, yeah are basically copyright that you purchase from the external party. 
yeah so if that happen you just again just like we do in the in a pattern we take the cost and then divide it by the useful life and then you got the the amortization amount for copyright same goes to the leasehold just now yeah the house that you hold okay the house that you own okay if it's on the leasehold agreement so that is also an intangible asset and you have to amortize you know you have to amortize based on the leasehold period yeah okay this is using the using the american uh, and and most uh, most country uh, policy yeah because i think that's why most of the singer for example you know they can they can have their copyright you know they can hold their copyright um you know um even this one you know for example our our late piramli you know his ancestor still enjoying the copyright that you know the that royalty. yeah the royal the uh, uh, royalty coming from the copyright yeah so this is the policy uh, so that means um uh for those who holding the copyright for the late piramli for example so they have to wait on 70 years you know after after he pass away you know so sorry um i think malaysia also follow this i think is i think this is this is the universal universal standard okay same goes to the lease hold just now okay lease hold so that means normally lease hold how long lease hold anyone own a lease hold house 99 yeah 99 years yeah so that mean if it 99 years so that means you divide by 99 years or 100 years yeah to get the amortization amount yeah just in case yeah just in case um if you make some renovation some improvement on the lease hold property okay that renovation you cannot depreciate okay the renovation that you make on something that either you rent or lease you cannot treat that as a non current asset but is a lease hold improvement and you have to divide you have to amortize it based on the based on the contract based on the contract yeah so that mean if you rent a building for and you have a contract for 5 years for example you make renovation yeah you make renovation on the building so you can amortize okay the amount that you spend for renovation yeah for example that you rent an office for 10 years for example contract and you make a renovation on that office so the renovation that you make you cannot treat them as a non current asset but as a intangible asset and you have to divide that in based on the period of contract yeah okay same goes to the franchises okay no most of the uh, most of the franchisee okay they 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 have to pay license yeah they have to pay license for that and they also have to uh, amortize those uh, those those amount same others go to trademark for example trade name you know you if you are uh, you know if if anything that you have to pay for you know if you if you if you purchase this you know you you can treat this as an intangible asset and also um Uh, and you have to amortize it and at the end of each year okay another unique uh, another unique um, um, items which fall into intangible asset is goodwill yeah goodwill is basically all the good names all the good image you know that that a brand have not necessarily a company or maybe a brand has you know 
for example, um, um, for example, Kit Kat, for example, you know, Kit Kat, Kit Kat is a brand, yeah, it's a brand, and you have to purchase, you know, you have to purchase that um, that brand, okay, and and um, so so if you if you purchase that company, for example. So you are basically paying more than what it should be, okay? So basically, goodwill, yeah. Goodwill is you pay more than what is appear on the financial statement. Normally, when we purchase a company, what are the basis that we use? Let's say that you want to purchase a company. How are you going to decide how much you're going to pay for that company? With the knowledge that you have now, let's say that you want to, you have, you have a lot of money, you know, you have a lot of money and you want to purchase a company, one company. What, how are you going to decide? What are the basis that we use to determine the cost of this company? Sorry? Sorry? Uh, yeah, but you have to pay based on something. You have to pay in quantum. You have to quantify the amount that you have to pay. So how are you going to determine that amount? Based on? Current asset and non-current asset. That close. But is that enough? Do you think that you want to buy a company just for example that this company has a non-current a total asset of just now? For, for example, Toyota just now have a 10, mil, 10 billions. So do you think that you want to pay 10 billions? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, to make to make a long a long story short, normally when we want to purchase a company, normally we look into the net worth of the company. Net worth of the company means that you don't if we haven't seen Toyota or UMW liabilities yet. Yeah. <laughs> you know, even though it has ten billion, maybe the liability has twenty billion. So you want to invest, you want to own a company, have a liability of. 20 billion? No, no right? So you also normally that's why we normally we norm, normally we rely on the net worth. Net worth is basically the difference between total asset and the liabilities. Yeah? So in the case of UMW, for example, that if the net net as total asset is 10 billion. And maybe the lab, maybe the liability is five billion, for example. So the worth of the company is five billion. So that may you may use as a as a basis, yeah, as a basis. So, but normally, will Toyota pay? I mean, willing to sell if you ask for five five billion? No, they will ask for more. So the more that you pay from. The net worth value is what we call the goodwill. Yeah? So, that is the example of goodwill. Goodwill is something that UMW cannot, cannot establish his own goodwill. Let's say that after he, after he made a market testing, for example, he realized that come, come, I mean, uh, investors willing to pay 20 billion for this, for UMW. So in that sense, how much the goodwill? 20, 20 billion minus 5 billion just now, so 15 billion of goodwill. So um, if UMW did not sell that company, UMW cannot recognize the goodwill that it has of 15 billion. You cannot. The accounting standard, even no, no rule and regulation allow a company to recognize its own goodwill. 
Just like Apple, for example, how much it's worth now? Apple? 50, 50 billion USD. Okay. So is that really the, the, the value? I think more than that. Yeah. So, so the, the extra maybe about 100 billion, for example, okay, maybe the goodwill. Yeah, maybe the goodwill. But Apple cannot recognize that as a goodwill. Okay. So, so who can recognize the goodwill? The purchaser of the company. So if you purchase UMW, your company share recognize the goodwill that you paid for when you purchase UMW. So we are dealing now with goodwill that you purchase, not something that you develop by your own. Okay? So if you purchase um, goodwill, in goodwill, even though it's categorized into intangible asset, you don't amortize. But we call it, you have to do impairment test. Every year, every year, you have to hire somebody expert and value the goodwill and see what is the current value of it. Yeah? For example, that you pay, you pay 15 billion, okay, goodwill for UMW. But when the valuer come and evaluate, actually it shouldn't be 15 million, only 10 billion. So that 5 billion is basically a loss. Okay, that's something that you have to recognize that in your financial statement. So that is basically the issue of, we call it, you have to do an impairment test for, for goodwill. How about R&D? Yeah, how about R&D? The R&D that incur, for example. Can you treat, I mean, yeah, this is the term. Can you capitalize it or you can expand it? R&D. Expand. expand, yeah. So how much money that the company spend, spend for example, for R&D, they cannot capitalize it. Capitalize meaning they cannot use that as an asset and amortize it, no, yeah. They have to, they have to expand that in the year that incur, right? Okay. So these are some of the analysis that we can apply based uh, on the less on the topic that we that we that we cover today. Okay. One of the significant ratio is this one: net asset over total as net sales over total asset it shows how efficient the company is in managing its asset. Yeah? Whether or not it can generate enough sales out of its asset. Yeah? Another is current ratio. Current ratio, just ability to pay any um, for commitment from liabilities. Yeah? From liabilities. Um, this is the formula, current asset divided by current liabilities. And if the current asset is higher than current liability, so the company is good. So that means the company is able to pay, okay, have the ability to pay any claim that made out of lab current liabilities. Yeah? And also this one, how long the company would I mean uh, would normally wait, okay, to get their account receivable paid, yeah. So this is another one. Yeah. So with that, uh, yeah. Thank you very much.